Hello. And thanks for having us. Is this working? on? Yeah, it works. Fine. So, yeah. The, we have 30 minutes, so let's dive right into some stories for, for grown-ups. What we basically do is that we, we invent stuff, we, we build stuff, or we do just craft stories. And this could be like this indoor cloud, which, which doubles as a lamp and a, and a weather station as well. Or it could be like a, a rocking chair that is able to, to charge an iPad while you rock on it. And, and it could get global attention like, like this, this product here. Uh, yeah, so uh, we're like we're gonna run through a couple of examples of stuff we did that's gonna bore you with this But we think it's kind of funny and that's how we basically do everything we do We do what we think is funny and this is very funny according to me. This is a, a magic carpet a flying carpet for pets uh, And we're trying to build a bigger one for humans But a guy who knew more about Magnus than I do told me don't do that because that's super dangerous if if the carpet flips you will get completely crushed so we had to put that one on, uh, on hold. Or we, in the past, also did, for instance, there were a music festival in Sweden where we had the fans of the festival prepare themselves by masturbating on camera. The girls and the boys uh, prepared for the non-musical part of the festival experience. Uh, or we build speakers. This is the iPod. No, this is the wall of sound, the biggest iPod speaker in the world. It's really big, and when the press got hold of this uh, speaker, they kind of competed in trying to describe it. Like, it was humongous, it got gigantic, biblical proportions. And then when Forbes India tried to describe this, they tried to describe it like this. It's about the size of a small woman, which is like super, yes, that's just plain weird. We. We, we're also into the uh, guns and ammo business. Here is, uh, this is a, a shotgun shell that fires flower seeds. Called, uh, yeah, it's called flower shell actually. There, that's me. Yeah, we're I trying it out. This one. Uh, and this was kind of funny until a security company in Miami called us asking, could we buy those and to shoot the burglars? because that could be like part of our environmental policy to use these kind of shells. And then we stopped just, uh, doing them. Yeah, and, and for example, like, because Austria is not uh, that globally successful when it comes to sports besides winter sports, we came up with this idea of a national Austrian pillow fight team that competes in the pillow fight World Cup in Brooklyn, New York and uh, which we also staged and invented. On Tuesday, the Pillow Fight World Cup was held in Brooklyn, New York, and that's what you want. People in the kingdom of bedbugs shaking their linens out in the open. <laughs> Nightmare. Okay, one last thing. Uh, this is the last dog thing as well. I'm very fond of the, everything vaguely uh, connected to dogs. This is no more woof. It's a device that reads the thoughts of dogs and translates them into English. It's currently a thing that we're developing. Uh, this is okay. A new device is being developed that could translate a dog's thoughts into English. It's ideal for anyone who wants a device that's constantly saying, Doo! Okay. Yeah, that's us. That's us. And, and as you can see, we, we experimented with a lot of stuff, like word of mouth marketing and bus marketing during the last few years. And my name is Christoph Brummer, and I'm one of the founders of the Tail Studio, which I've just recently founded with, with Pear. Uh, like nearly 15 years ago, I, I founded another company, which is called Man on the Moon. It's a digital agency in Vienna. And, we find out that digital is like a huge game changer for storytelling, for, for telling those tales. And so we move so rapidly from linear to non-linear stuff or, or from media to transmedia, as all those uh, scientific guys call it. Uh, and from like typical advertising above the line campaigns, we move from a high level of fragmentation of micro stories that we are telling uh, 
and it's very much about this tension between sell and tell in a way. To a lot of people in marketing where I'm rooted in, uh, storytelling is like a very tempting wolf in a, in a sheep's clothing in a way. And, but to tell is not automatically to sell, that's, that's really good. Uh, so, so basically why we're here, we're here like to share uh, some of the learnings from these experiments over the last few years and some techniques we successfully used to hijack different kinds of conversations and also some really grown-up fun we had doing all this stuff. And uh, I'm Per Cromwell and I've uh, been working under different flags for the last couple of ten years. For the longest time I was working at the agency in Sweden called Studio Total, which I run with my cousin Thomas Massetti. Uh, I'm also running an invention lab called Nordic Society for Invention and Discovery, based in Sweden and uh, Finland. And quite early on we realized that what we did in marketing, we could use that for something more important. And that attention that we were able to get out of creating these viral campaigns could would be put to better use if we addressed maybe more serious matters than just helping brands to sell products. So the first experiment that we did trying to try these things out was a thing that we did in Sweden in Almedalen, which is a political rally held annually. It's like huge, it's like 20, like 20,000 people go there, it's lobbyists, it's spin doctors, media, politicians, everyone go there. And then the cultural, no let's see, the national theater came to us and they wanted our help to create some attention on cultural issues. Basically they wanted the, the leader of the political parties to talk about culture. And we said, okay, let's try this. We then realized that these politicians was kind of hard to get. Everyone was trying to get to them, so we did the opposite. We decided to become politicians instead. So we founded a cultural party consisting of uh, cultural personalities, authors, writers, musicians. We made it, we staged it really properly, we printed balloons, we compiled a party program, we just copy-pasted from all the other political parties things and we assembled that, testimonials, everything. And this press conference was quite attended and when they made a poll in the biggest Swedish tabloid, it turned out that, what is it like, 11.9% could vote for our party, which freaked the, the other politicians out completely. Uh, all of a sudden this new threat came out of nowhere and everyone started to talk about cultural issues, uh, arguing that there's no need for a cultural party because the existing party, they have a quite sufficient policy already uh, to cover these matters. And this attention and this support was really weird actually because I don't think that people really looked into the kind of people that we hired to play these roles of the politicians. For instance, the runner-up for the uh, Minister of Defense was this guy, Ulle. Uh, and he is a very nice guy, but he's not... He, back then he wasn't that reliable. He was struggling with a drug addiction, and his only motivation for wanting to become the Minister of Defense was that he always wanted to drive a tank. And still we got this kind of uh, huge uh, support. But what we did then is that we took the long run. It's, instead of addressing the people that we were asked to address, we addressed everyone else. Coming from a marketing background, that's something that you usually don't do because you pay. Every impact you need to pay for. So reaching everyone is virtually impossible. But when it comes to a good story, making it as big as possible sometimes is much more efficient if we want to reach these basically six, seven people that we were addressing. We, after this uh, action, we looked into what kind of, what happened and a lot of people were starting to actually talk about culture after this and we could see on Google and other platforms that all of a sudden actually we created not a big change but a small change. People people started to think slightly different. 
So ever since, we've been trying to take some of uh, like the, the earnings that we make from, from running an agency and the skills and then trying to do these kind of projects and trying to help organizations, NGOs, um, cultural institutions to get more attention on important matters. Uh, and we did it in Sweden and then we wanted to try this elsewhere. Yes, like, like in Austria. Like in and, Austria, for instance. Yeah. We, we tried out these methods of attention getting also in Austria, and which is quite a comparable country to Sweden in, in, in lots of many ways. Yeah. And we used it for putting together attention on the issue of the Austrian pension system, which is like in a really crappy situation, uh, like with an aging European community population and economies, which is on the way down, uh, and a political deadlock when it comes to discussing new solutions. So what we... What we... Uh, this is actually a very like, important and interesting topic, I would say, because there's like a lot of topics that usually get talked about and where activistic actions are more frequent. When it comes to the political or the pension system, there were not that many political actions around. So that, that issue basically was in the, in the shadow. So I think that this is also like an interesting topic to... to use these tools for topics that usually are not that talked about. Yes, and, and then we thought, why would want to take another angle at this problem of the, of the uh, aging population and the pension systems? Um, what could be a solution? Like more kids maybe? Like, like getting people to make more kids? And then maybe more sex would help, of course, because it's like, yeah, it's like... Really, usually it works. Yeah, yeah. Us. And so, a more and better sex, and what about a sex school? And what about an Austrian international school of sex? Which we found it then, we found it one. It's like we bought this castle. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. Uh, but we placed this school in a secret location in the Wienerwald, a uh, very like, secretive place, of course, for privacy of all the students, and uh, like the school will accept only a small classes, learning, practical sex, or better life. And we placed it in a really secret location, but as usual, quality journalism found out where it was. Bildungsoffensive mal anders. Das ist Österreichs heißeste Schule. In der Nähe von Wien eröffnet jetzt Europas erste Schule für Sex. In Gruppenseminaren sollen hier Liebesunkundige... Ja, yeah, so the, the Bild, the Bild uh, was the first meal that, that thought that they know where it was located. Uh, but of course it was just a complete illusion, we framed that. And, and to make this school even more real and believable, the school would of course have a proper website and completely with the bios of the teachers and the courses, plan information and posters and folders and everything you would expect from a proper school. And of course you need like a headmistress, headmaster headmistress like Ilva Maria Thompson, Swedish by coincidence, and she's like a Swedish sexologue which is a word, a word I just learned from Pea a few hours ago. Swedish word, I don't know if the translation sexologue. is right. Sexologue, it's like a sex scientist. It sounds nice. And she's also a former erotic film actress. And she's like the headmaster of the school. And most important, of course, that shouldn't be missed, is a TV commercial. A TV commercial as well, which was shot in a sufficiently super cheesy way, uh, announcing the Austrian International School of Sex. And yeah. And what we did is we took this TV commercial, which was our plan to get, get it banned and uh, this always this is one learning is stuff that gets banned always sparks a lot of attention so we sent out like broadcast ready tapes uh, to the major Austrian TV stations public and private with instructions to air these commercials in prime time well the they refused to do so so that was perfect and overnight this this commercial became the most viewed band commercial in Austria that gained a lot of views on YouTube and was removed, uploaded again, and so on and so on. And from that, we took it to the international level and it really very quickly it became a real global thing. And this is like a really useful learning we had here. It's like Austrian things are very common in Austria. Uh, well, put it down well. That sounds obvious, but it's really like quite important. So Austria is also a very small country, anything in Austria that it gets noticed, just slightly talked about abroad in other countries, usually gets very much talked about in Austria itself. So uh, this is what we call the big in Japan effect. Make something big 
in another in other countries and bring it back to to your own country. Yeah. And so on. Yeah, and taking it from global to national, national attention is much easier. So the school got sex on the agenda, then we revealed the whole hoax. And having everybody, yeah, this is like really super. Wer nicht kommt, fliegt. This is like, this is brilliant. And lots of brilliant stuff. So, so yeah. Um, by the way, the school isn't quite dead yet. People still apply to it. Uh, another example of a real bluff. Uh, well, partly real is like the Kafka slaughter. Yeah, knowing that real is good, uh, we wanted to take this one step further and we wanted to try it again. It worked the first time, so now, okay, let's address another issue with a problem. That's the education system. Uh, Austria is dropping on the PISA index. It's like a problem with kids not really learning how to read and, and to spell properly. Uh, so we wanted to try out, if, what if we took this, uh, tried to frame this in a way and fast forward the development slightly and to see wh how could this look in 50 years from now. If it continues like this, kids getting worse and worse in, in uh, spelling, where will we end up? And this is a suggestion or a, a very like dystopic uh, interpretation from our side where we could end up. So, so what we did is we, we founded another thing, like a publishing company, publishing house claiming that we will bring back the classics uh, into the classrooms again, like Kafka, uh, quality, quality literature and we proudly stated that we were founded by the European Union and so we launched the first book, The Castle, The Schloss and we built in like approximately 5,000 spelling mistakes into that book which then we took and we sent it out to teachers, to schools, to the Ministry of Education in Austria and of course the media and some first reactions claimed that this is like the slaughter of Franz Kafka. This is like the Frankfurt Allgemeine Feton, also in the printed issue. They really had a huge story about that. And, and, and slaughter of Franz Kafka paid by the European Union. Yeah. So we, we printed 1,000 books. Uh, we created this uh, publisher called Adrian, Adrian Schulz. Maybe Adrian Schulz himself is here today. I don't know, maybe he would swing by. He, he is like a kind of shady guy, actually. He, before he went into the publishing business, he was into the escalator business. So he seems the guy that could do basically anything for money. Uh, he was also extremely rude. So when we sent out the pre press release of the letter, it was also full of spelling mistakes. Uh, the, the journalist, they called Adrian, uh, who picked up, and they were like, what are you doing? This, like, this is like horrible. And then he said, well, but if you wouldn't talk that much about it, the kids wouldn't notice. And if you want perfect spelling, buy a dictionary, asshole, and go to Korea. He was like extremely rude, which, uh, and saying things like really weird stuff, like literature is not about spelling. Uh, which I could partly agree with, but in this sense it was just also weird. Um, and this response from Adrian triggered even more attention. So by having this weird guy on the other end of the phone just drove the journalist mad. Uh, so it <laughs> kept on growing until we reached this point. Yeah, and this also created a real discussion in Austria, what we aimed for, a real discussion about the education system or at least about spelling in a way. Uh, so this is Mr. Rosenkranz, he's like a yeah, proper politician and who started a real urgent parliamentary request to our chancellor, uh, wanting to know who made this deal with the European Union about this cool book. And uh, this spread it quickly to all media channels, including several TV news. Um, so, yeah, at least, and at last we showed that the politicians care about spelling. And once the discussion about spelling, or rather non-spelling, was rooted, uh, we revealed the purpose of this hoax and this got just as much attention and people started talking about the education system at least a little bit. People wanted the book for sure. Um, so we keep on noticing after doing these experiments that okay this works. So then we keep on expanding the experiment, trying other things, addressing other issues. And there is like a problem with Sweden is a great country in many ways, but we have a problem with the wages. Uh, men earn way more than women. Uh, the Swedish feminists they came up with a solution for this, but they did not really know how to get everyone to talk about this uh, unjust wages. And if you combine all the women, they earn uh, in total 
what is it, approximately 10,000 euros less every minute compared to the men. So also at Almedal in this political rally, they wanted, uh, the feminists wanted everyone to talk about uh, 10,000 euros or 100,000 Swedish kroner. And we said, okay, let's try that. This is uh, the leader of the feminist party, Gudrun. She is a kind of controversial person. Uh, a lot of people don't really like her. Uh, I think partly because she's a feminist, so these angry white men, they tend not to like her. She's an ex-left-wing politician, which also makes a certain part of the population see red. And I'm not sure about this, but she might also be a vegetarian. So basically she's challenging <laughs> Or like the, the, the angry white men's complete lifestyle. So, so we were thinking if we could just make them to become even more angry and like stop hiding in these comments or forums, but just to make a public uh, outrage, uh, maybe we could, using the technique of my enemy's enemy is my friend, a lot of young persons that actually was could sympathize with the feminist didn't do that. But if we would force them to choose between Gudrun or the angry white man, we thought that at least some of them would go for Gudrun and that would be more than they already had. This is a very small party. We basically wanted more, more angry people. Uh, we did this, we took uh, 100,000 kroner. Uh, they didn't have any money, so we had to give them the money. It was intended for a boat, actually. Uh, and so uh, Thomas and I, we gave her the money, uh, we called for a press conference, she burned the money, uh, saying that this is, as an illustration, how painful it is to see money go to waste. It's the same thing that they, she argued, this is also the money that the Swedish women earn less, is also money going to waste. This became uh, talk, quite, quite talked about in, in uh, Sweden. Uh, they got what they wanted. People started talking about these unjust wages. We did this big in Japan effect as well. We sent it abroad. We got coverage uh, all over the world for this. Uh, we got a lot of haters. I think 90% of everyone who, who heard about this hated it. Uh, maybe even more. Uh, 10% liked it or loved it, which was like great for them because uh, only like 1% loved it before. So they had like this huge impact of getting haters. So sometimes it's easier to find who to, to instead of trying to find fans, to find uh, enemies. I, I've been thinking all day if I should talk about this slide. It's kind of funny, but, but what happened actually is that when I was wrinkling this money, to make it look big, my life spending should look a little bit impressive, at least, I thought. So I was wrinkling and putting in a paper bag or a plastic bag. Uh, it call, the phone uh, rang. It was a journalist from Denmark, they, the very prestigious newspaper. They asked, they just wanted to run some facts before publishing the, the article. That, and they asked if, is it true that Gudrun Schumann, the leader of the Feminist Party, will eat 100,000 kroner? And then I was like thinking for a second, maybe, maybe, I sh maybe that's like a better idea. But, and, then, and then I started thinking, no, but that's like a very, um, the, uh, the symbolic action of eating money is like something completely different. And I think it's also it's extremely hard to eat money, trying to explain while you're eating it at the same time. So we just like skipped that. So basically what, what all these things, they, they, they clearly point us in a direction. And the direction is that if you want to tell something, it's better to tell it in a way so it gets retold. And if you want to get it retold, a, a proper illustration sometimes is really convenient. Uh, and actually to show how it is instead of just saying it. In Sweden we also have, a, we have like many problems, but one problem is that we have the Swedish Democrats. They're like in the parliament and they're right-wing assholes and they want to throw out all the immigrants. Uh, we don't think that, and they, they are just like stupid guys, you hear that from interviews, but, but we wanted to show that even more clearly, so we asked them to hold up a letter saying that we love Muslims. We called them, asked them. They said, no, we, we're not going to do that. And then we called them one and one instead, asking, can you just hold up one, one letter, and then what's perfectly fine. Uh, and then we compiled this, we love Muslims, which is like a perfect way, a illust good illustration of saying that these guys are kind of stupid. They should not run the country. And now they're basically going to be the third biggest party in Sweden.
Yes, so basically we think that almost everything can become a good story. Okay, uh, and we actually think of a lot of good stories already out there, but just in the wrong place. So one thing we also learned is to create a new context, context for the story. Uh, we tell it's like a giraffe in the Berlin Zoo is nothing really spectacular, but a giraffe in the subway definitely is. So for us, there are some basic principles of telling stories, and yeah, let's continue talking about that. And yeah. we have to speed up. I just yeah, I, I maybe I skipped the bus. Skip. It, it's really funny actually. I make it super fast. Uh, a magazine writing about what's wrong in Sweden, telling these stories in the magazines doesn't create that much attention because people know what to expect from that magazine. People don't really talk about the thing that this political magazine were writing. So basically, we, we as the principle as Christoph talked about, if we move that someone else, maybe somewhere else, it might all of a sudden work. So we took the content of a magazine uh, and then we uh, hired a guide bus we, we parked the guide bus behind the regular guide buses and when the people got on our bus they got to hear the real story, the hidden stories. Forced sterilizations, forced evictions, all these things. But, and when it's told from a guide bus then the king gets really angry because we talked about the, the connections between the royal family and the Nazis. And all of a sudden people were paying attention to these stories. So, basically, this is sort of stories for grown-ups. And we were kind of uh, thinking that we had figured out a way of telling these stories in, in Sweden and in Austria, never really like addressed a really, really serious topic. Uh, so we were a bit surprised when the opposition of Belarus called us, and they wanted help. The problem with Belarus is this guy, Alexander Lukashenko. He's the dictator since 20 years. He's, he's like really... He looks kind of happy there because he's a lucky guy. He's like been able, he's been saved by the bell several times. There's like a lot of things that you could say about Belarus which are not being said. Instead, people tend to talk about this. Uh, we thought maybe we, maybe we could do something about this. So we accepted, okay, we will think about it at least. So we started looking into the situation of Belarus. Uh, the last dictatorship of, of Europe and we found this wonderful protest within uh, Belarus. It's like an activist putting small protest signs on uh, plush animals, uh, putting them out in the public, having the KGB, having to take them away or basically arrest these toys, which makes them look silly, which is really good because it's really uh, dangerous for a dictator to look to appear silly. So we thought maybe we should support these, these activists by continuing to make Lukashenko look silly and drop air, uh, teddy bears from an airplane in parachutes. Uh, so we started looking into the possibilities of doing this, uh, asking pilots, they're known for being courageous and brave and, and overall crazy, to uh, fly an airplane and they said, no, we can't do that. Uh, and they were referring to a couple of years ago, two Americans were shot down and killed when taking a wrong turn in a hot air balloon, which is a kind of non-hostile vehicle, but they still shut it down. And also they have like a very strong air defense. But we thought that this needs to be done, so we bought an airplane, uh, we learned how to fly it, we bought uh, 1,000 teddy bears, and then we uh, equipped them with parachutes and protest signs. Uh, we flew to uh, Lithuania, and then we waited for the Independence Day when Lukashenko showed his whole army in, in glory. Uh, the day after, we, we figured out that maybe they will be a bit hangover after the day after. So very early in the morning, we took off. Then we flew in over the border. Uh, we flew to Minsk and then we dropped the teddy bears. Lukashenko was outraged. Uh, he, he started firing people everywhere. He fired two top ranking generals, chief of secure, uh, border control, like basically a lot of people got uh, fired. Uh, it also triggered a diplomatic uh, conflict between Sweden and Belarus and that in its turn led to more sanctions uh, against Belarus. We were, KGB wanted us to come to Minsk for interrogation uh, and to be arrested. We said, no, we don't want to go. You could come here if you want to talk to us. And Lukashenko didn't show up. And then they changed tactics. And they started sending these weird emails 
uh, tons of them to everyone involved in these actions from weird Gmail accounts. That's really weird, and someone is actually writing this, it's kind of weird. Uh, also, this protest triggered new protests uh, around the world, uh, teddy bears being placed outside embassies. This is just like two weeks ago in Minsk. And basically this is from who wants to be a millionaire. But now our time is up, so maybe yeah, we just should just... One thing, in our opinion, like confrontation is at the very heart of every story. And storytelling can be so many things, a message with morals, like we saw, or a crafted system that helps people to escape reality or to understand more, or simply being entertaining. And when the fight for people's attention gets more fierce in marketing, uh, this creates new challenges, but from our perspective, also new opportunities. And hopefully these new tools can help stuff we showed you today, uh, attention, create attention to issues that matter. Free Belarus. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much.